I think this is the uh, most punctual and best looking panel we've ever had. Okay. 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 So, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, American University Museum at the Katzen Art Center. <clears throat> Susan Goldman is founding director of the Printmaking Legacy Project, a nonprofit dedicated to the documentation, preservation, and conservation of printmaking practice and history. Uh, she's also director of and owner of Lily Press in Rockville, Maryland. Her collaborative prints include local artists and artists from across the United States, including Enrique Chigoya, Sam Gilliam, Annette Lerner, Lynn Myers, E.J. Montgomery, Renee Stout, Patricia Underwood, Sharon Wolpoff, and William Wiley, just to name but a few. Goldman received the National Endowment for the Arts grant in 2011-2012 as producer and director of Midwest Matrix, an hour-long documentary videotape DVD on the fine art of printmaking tradition in, of the American Midwest. Goldman exhibits nationally and internationally, and her work is in private and public collections worldwide. She is the curator of Forward Press 21st Century Printmaking, or as it re was renamed last night, the Kick-Ass Print Show. <laughs> I give you Susan Goldman. Is this, this is on, yes, okay. I wanted to um, thank uh, Jack Rasmussen for um, working with me three years ago, we sat down to lunch and I asked if I could do a print show and Jack said yes and <clears throat> originally it was to occur in 218 and then he said do you mind if I move you to 219 and you could have the first floor and I said yes, that's awesome. Uh, so I'm really thankful to Jack that this is happening and um, I'm very proud today to present Forward Press 21st Century Printmaking. Um, I'm bringing today some of the most um, terrific print artists that I know and I've had the opportunity to interact with over the years. And um, I want to thank all of you for trekking out here and being part of this. And um, the goal was to bring printmaking to Washington, D.C. I walked into <clears throat> the printmaking studio when I was a sophomore in college at Indiana University in 1977 and uh, Rudy Pizzotti was my professor there, and when I walked in, it was the most charismatic studio in the university, and Rudy had told me stories that over the years that the Library of Congress used to host um, international or national shows that artists from all across the country could see their work, and that's where people came to see what was happening. And over the years, printmaking has expanded, and there's biennials all over the country. But um, I really wanted printmaking in Washington. And so you'll see today an extraordinary show. It's gone beyond my wildest expectations as it was being installed. It just came to life in such a way that was, I'm so full of joy about it. And um, so what I wanted to do today was to um, have the artists introduce themselves and say a little bit about their work. And we will go down through the, the group and, um, and then we will open the floor for questions. So, thank you. So, the first artist is Richard Peterson from Vi Vinci. Here, you can talk. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, my name is Richard Peterson and I live in a town called Ventura, California. It's a coastal town and uh, I taught 16 years at Ventura College, and I got married and had two kids. Then I had three kids, and so I had to find a full-time job. So I moved to Visalia and taught 20 years at College of the Sequoias, where I uh, started their lithography program. And uh, lithography means more to me than anything, and mostly it's because of the smell of lithotine. And <laughs> Litho is one of those things that gets under your skin and you just can't stop doing it. But in 2015, November 2015, on the television set, I saw an iPad being uh, advertised. And that very night, I ordered from the Apple store my iPad and my iPencil. And so that's my main uh, way of working now is working on iPads. And then I'll take it to a stone and then print my iPad drawings on a stone. Is that good? And tell them the subject of your work. Oh. 
Um, the subject of my work started out with my bull terrier, Alice. And then uh, one day I met a drag queen, and she reminded me of when I was uh, a f uh, junior at the San Francisco Art Institute, and I met a drag queen who I didn't know was a drag queen. He was an old man with a hunchback walking down the street, and I started drawing him, and he said, well, why don't you come watch me perform? I had no idea what he was doing. So I go backstage, and this man uh, takes his uh, clothes off and puts on a brassiere, <laughs> and then he starts putting on makeup, and by the time he was dressed, he was the most energetic, uh, exciting person on the face of the earth. And that was my first instance drawing a drag queen. And what interested me about that was the um, transition from being old, decrepit, to being Marilyn Monroe on stage. <laughs> and I thought, how could that be? And so. I did that for a while, but I stopped. But when I moved back to uh, Ventura, I um, ran into a drag queen. And so for the last couple years, that's what I've been doing, is mostly drawings of drag queens on an iPod. I iPad. <laughs> is that good? OK. <laughs> Next artist, Tom Huck. Hi. My name's Tom Huck. Um, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. and. Uh, I do really big woodcuts about really bad people <laughs> doing lots of bad things. Um, I started um, getting into woodcut when I was a junior in college. They made me take a class in printmaking to graduate. But up until that time, I was 13 and my grandparents took me on a trip to Italy and right before I went in to see the Sistine Chapel. There's a, there's a gallery museum before you walk into there, and they had a whole, so I'm, this is 1984, so I'm 13, that the whole room was filled with Albert Durer's apocalypse woodcuts. So I'm like 12 when I saw that, and I thought, they, these are really cool. I didn't know what a woodcut was. I didn't know what a print was. And then I came home, and a couple of weeks later, my parents went on a family vacation to D.C., right here, and we went to the National Gallery of Art, and while I was there, they had Dewar's Apocalypse up. So in four weeks, I saw Dewar's Apocalypse twice, and I thought, I gotta get a book on that guy. And so I bought a Dover publication called The Complete Woodcuts of Albert Dewar, begged my mom for the money, and, and that was it. So Dewar was born in 1471, I was born in 1971. That's not a mistake. Uh, that's not a coincidence, um, and my stuff is really about the downfall of uh, American society slowly, you know, and a lot of politics, a lot of hillbillies, a lot of bad guys, um, your typical American day in the country. So that's it. That's what I do. Our next artist, Michael Menchaca, from San Antonio, Texas. Hello, testing. OK. Well, um, so I prepared a little statement for you guys on my iPhone. So hopefully that won't distract too much. But um, so my project, the Codex Migratus, which was the first iteration of what is on display here, was uh, developed in 2010. So about nine years ago, um, and this was a project devoted to addressing social issues, addressing uh, Latinx communities um, by means of an invented mythology. So I was using the framework of, a, of an ancient Mesoamerican codex um, to talk about, um, it provided me the, uh, the definitive model for presenting complex narrative imagery, talking about class inequality, uh, civil rights issues, and the distribution of privileges across the Americas. Um, and over the years, I've developed a personal lexicon consisting of Mayan logograms and logographic appropriations from pop culture and uh, news headlines. Um, and uh, through this, I've been using animal archetypes to speak about different, um, different types of people um, through uh, anthropomorphic animals. And um, 
this is a way to celebrate the storytelling traditions of our ancient ancestors um, and to provide an alternate strategy for discussing today's trending topics. So my interest has always been in bringing multiple perspectives and interpretations to political debates, but bring it to a contemporary art context where the white cube is a way to, or it's a place for debate or open discussion without any judgment. So it's like, it's sort of like a Trojan horse to get people to talk about um, identity or issues that um, mean something to me. So printmaking provided me an entry point to, um, as an undergraduate student on the path to self-discovery. Um, this medium has a significant social history tied to the Chicano experience. It gave me agency um, for the, Ch it, printmaking itself gave uh, the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s uh, a medium to uh, talk about um, political subjects. And so in short, while I was completing my MFA at RISD, I started to work with animation and so part of my installation on display has some video installation components, three monitors synchronized, which is uh, a task that I don't recommend anyone take on their own. But um, for this case, this was my first um, on my own triple monitor configuration uh, tied with a printmaking installation. Um, so I hope that you all enjoy it. Um, but it's up on display for now, so thank you. Um, next is Steve Prince from Virginia, originally from New Orleans. Absolutely. Hello, um, my name is um, Steve Prince, and I'm uh, originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I currently live in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, and I, um, I am the Director of Engagement in Artists in Residence at the um, Muscarelli Museum at the College of William and Mary. Um, I'm going to go back to a place where I was born and raised, which was New Orleans, Louisiana, and share with you just a little bit about the philosophical foundation of my work, which comes out of the funerary tradition of New Orleans, and which is a jazz funeral, which is broken up into two parts. Um, the first part is called the dirge, which is the mournful tune that is laid, played for someone who's being laid to rest. But once that person is laid to rest, that music transforms from a mournful tune into a celebratory one, which is called the second line. And I've used that as the philosophical hinge point of my work because I believe that the death and dying, those things in which we have to encounter every day. Um, but I believe that we constantly work every day to work towards that second line where we can have a life of full of love and of hope and uh, rejuvenation. Um, and, we, and I believe that we can attain that without dying. Um, so this piece that I deposited here in this particular exhibition is called Communal Resurrection, Song for Aya. Aya is an Adinkra symbol coming out of Ghana. And Aya, if you look at the motif within my pieces, you'll see a fern as an earring of one person. And that fern is a symbol of endurance, um, a symbol of perseverance. And the, the panels are, is designed that it's a linear, non-historical linear piece. And so if you go from each panel, you can walk along and you can follow some of the historical elements, but then I jazz it up. I, I, hip hop it up and flip it all around in different ways, pull you back and forth through time. The first panel alludes to the time of slavery and I juxtapose the cotton fields to the cotton club and it's a space where the spirituals are enacted. I'm free, praise the Lord, I'm free, no longer bound. And go from that panel to the second one and I jump you from the spirituals in the fields, I bring you to hip hop. And you'll see on the ground, you'll see a little record. And it's uh, the Sugar Hill Gang. A hip hop, a hip to the hip, to hip hip, a hop, you don't stop. A rockin' to the bang bang, boogie say up, jump to boogie to the rhythm of the boogie to be. <laughs> and then I bring you to the third panel. And you move on, and then you get there, and on the stage is Minnie Rippleton, and she's holding a microphone, her hand is upraised into the heavens, and loving you is easy, cause you're beautiful. I'm not gonna hit the next note. But, and then you go to that fourth panel and you see blown on the horn, you see Coltrane, a love supreme, a love supreme. And by the time you get to the fifth panel, you'll note that the love supreme was blowing a note in the ribbon that was so beautiful and so tactile and so kinesthetic that it goes from one project and it touches into another project and touches and it goes to Sing Sing Prison, which is in New York. And there, it bespeaks what took place in the first panel, which was the issue of slavery. And in the last panel, 
the slavery that is going on continually within our nation, within the prison industrial complex. And it bespeaks our job to take the fern, the symbol of endurance, to break those cycles, to bring about a closeness within community, and for us to go out into the streets with a message of love and a hope that we can all get to the second line. Thank you. Um, next is Dennis McNett, who was a visiting artist in residence for two weeks at American U University. And the installation you'll see into the exhibit, um, Dennis has been here working since March 25th. And Dennis just is from Texas. And now, take it away, Dennis. Hi. Uh, Dennis McNett. Um, I'm not going to sing for you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I got introduced to uh, printmaking when I was 18. I went to a, a community college in Virginia Beach where I grew up. And uh, I was really impatient with everything that I was learning. So with a, with a drawing, I'd go to draw with a charcoal and I'd always snap it because I was pressing too hard. Or if I would try to do a painting, I'd get too impatient and make a muddy mess with it. And then the, the guy that was instructing, he had this little tiny printing press. And one day he took out a block and he started carving it. And I didn't know what he was doing. And then he inked it, he rolled like ink across the surface of it. And then he cranked it through the press. And like when he pulled it up, it looked like everything that I was into as a kid. It looked like the, the punk rock album covers. And it looked like the skateboard graphics from the 80s. Like it had this harsh graphic quality to it. And from that point on, I was just hooked on printmaking. So I've been doing uh, prints for a long time, um, but I, I, you know, I also uh, worked construction and a lot of blue collar jobs for a long time, so I know how to build things. And not that I got bored with prints, but I wanted it, I didn't want it just sitting on the wall anymore. I wanted it to be on a mask, or I wanted it to be running down the street, or I wanted it to be an installation. So I started using prints um, to cover my sculptures, installations, mask performances, and I'm also very into storytelling. So I started um, make kind of making up my own mythology to talk about um, to talk about all sorts of things, you know, uh, spiritual things, to talk about um, social things, to talk about political things. But um, um, yeah, I think that's all I got. Thanks. The next artist is April Flanders from North Carolina. So I'm actually from Boone, North Carolina. Well, I'm not from there. I live there now. I've lived there for enough time that I've naturalized there. And that's in the, the hills of Western North Carolina. So I'm actually a hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not gonna be on one of those prints. But um, uh, my work that I did here, I've actually been here since Sunday, last Sunday, installing it. Uh, I got here last Sunday and have, have been installing from Monday to Thursday. It's a piece that I created for the express purpose of showing it here. And um, last June, I was in a, I was at Aramont College of Craft, or School of Craft, and Susan called me and she said, I have a wall for you. And I said, oh. And she said, it's 38 feet long. And I said, oh. <laughs> and she kind of talked me into doing this. And so I created this piece that, um, is made from thousands of little tiny pieces, and it's uh, a piece that addresses two invasive species that are aquatic invasives that are uh, primarily found in the Great Lakes, but they're spreading across the, the nation pretty rapidly, and it's the quagga mussels and the zebra mussels, and they are filter feeders, and so what's happening is they filter diatoms and algae from the water. They're actually changing the color of the Great Lakes and changing the, uh, the ecosystem. And so they're actually devastating the, the, the main food source that keeps the, keeps the whole chain alive. And so um, the piece is called Filter. And uh, the first question I've had from pretty much everybody is how many pieces are up there? And I, to that I say a whole lot. Um, there are 75 species of algae and diatoms represented. I, I started the piece with the intention of actually cataloging all of them that are in the Great Lakes, and I got about halfway through the alphabet. <laughs> and it's, um, it's a piece that's created with monotype, screen print, and laser cutting. And um, it was a, an incredible amount of labor, but um, 
it's, it's an, a really cool piece, and I was really pleased to be included in the show. So thank you. Um. Bove Lyons from Tennessee, the Circus Orbis ringleader. Um, I just wanted to say, and I'm sure other people felt this impulse, that it's a great honor to be part of this show that Susan's organized and to be with this cohort of artists. So um, I'm sure we'll say that again and again at certain points here, but I wanted to be one of the first to say it. Um, I have been at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville uh, for 34 years. And uh, in that capacity, I'm a professor of art and director of the hoax archives. And for uh, about 40 years, I've, been, I've had the responsibility of preserving and promoting the hoax archives, which I first acquired most of the material at a storage locker of unclaimed goods in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And uh, I keep discovering more crates and containers with material from the hoax archives. The hoax archives is the scholarly and cultural work of uh, Everett Ormsby Hoax, founder, uh, uh, director of Hoax Scholarly Lithography. And over the years, I've discovered crates that have had archaeology, medicine, natural history. But one way that Everett Ormsby Hoax sought to advance his scholarly work was to do jobbing work for Thaddeus Evergood, the founder of Circus Orbis. And uh, uh, we oftentimes face these challenges and compromises in our life, you know, in, in terms of trying to do the, the work we love. And I think he, he fell in love with Circus Orbis. Uh, Thaddeus Evergood was, it turns out, from East Tennessee, from Jacksboro. Uh, and the circus was created when he was a street performer in Rome in 1908. And uh, you can read the story about Circus Orbis in the text panel. And like other stories that you're hearing as part of this exhibit, printmaking is very much connected to our personal and social and cultural histories. And so uh, my work as director of the hoax, sounds like H-O-A-X, archives, is um, a way of investigating those stories and spinning them anew. So the next is Nicole Piantrantoni from Walla Walla, Washington. Thanks, Susan. It's always fun to say. Indeed, I'm from Walla Walla, Washington, where I teach uh, printmaking and book arts at Whitman College. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be in this show. And my work that's displayed in the gallery is called Implications. And it's uh, approximately nine feet tall by about 30 feet wide. And it's a series of artist books that expand to create a panoramic image of icebergs um, in Iceland. And the work is actually a collaboration with the poet Devin Wooten. And so uh, Devin also happens to be my husband. So we, we've done a number of collaborations on book works over the past several years. And the work stems out of a time I spent in Iceland. I was there as a Fulbright um, for a whole year living there and looking at how humans relate to a changing landscape. Um, and specifically how humans often idealize or romanticize the natural world. And so for this piece, I was interested in using the book form. And each book is approximately the size of an encyclopedia. And thinking about how these books could contain a world, and not just you know, a world we read about, but that literally expands and opens up right, with all these accordions uh, to create this really expansive world and this image of these icebergs that are fleeting and disappearing at this location in Iceland. And so the text, that part of the collaboration, each one of the accordions does fold up into a book. And it actually contains a 400-page document from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so it is actually a, a massive text, but Devin, who is a poet, worked uh, to do excision poetry, where he sort of blacked out pieces of that text uh, to highlight in white text what now becomes a poetic version of that document. So it reads as both a poem and the original document simultaneously, and then opens up to create this massive image. So it's sort of a record of this place and a record of this time we're in right now. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. The next artist is Carrie Lingscheit from Illinois. Carrie? Thank you, Susan. I'm also going to use my notes because I'll make a lot more sense that way. Um, my work explores themes of human behavior 
interaction, and the malleable nature of remembrance, presenting equivocal narratives that are often characterized by omission, distortion, and hyperbole. I'm fascinated by small gestures, deliberate posturing, unguarded action, and reaction by people. All of these little movements that comprise relationships between people. Perception and remembrance are always imperfect. Our every moment is subject to omission, as well as misinterpretation and embellishment by the imagination and by emotions. In turn, each subsequent recalling of these experiences is subject to repression, convolution, and dissipation. Some memories become even further permuted by conflation, separate remembrances becoming morphed together like beads of moisture joining together on glass. As our very identities are tangled up in these past experiences, I'm fascinated uh, by the notion of the gaps left by these absences of information, these holes within the structure of our past and present lives, these half-imagined pasts that become layered among the facade of one's current self. I believe that these images, as chronicled across copper surfaces and eventually consigned to paper impression, invite a, di a dialogue with viewers because we all crave familiarity, endlessly longing to connect ourselves with other people through fragments and layers of shared experience. And I also want to talk a little bit about why I am drawn to printmaking. Um, in a world of modern technology, I'm drawn to intaglio printmaking because of the directly tactile relationship it requires to both physical materials and to the developing image. The intaglio plate develops gradually as each mark builds upon the previous, creating a physical record of past action across the metal surface in what often becomes truly a labor of love. Mistakes are not easily undone. They must be painstakingly corrected or inventively incorporated, often leading down new paths of creativity and innovation in a way that control Z options would have likely stymied. I see this finished intaglio plate as a sculptural, visible chronicling of each decision, whether additive or subtractive, enacted over the course of making each piece. This methodology allows me to maintain balance between careful composition and unanticipated results. Happy accidents. The physical process of creating each place thus parallels the vacillating, simultaneously creative and erosive qualities of memory formation and recall that are also important components of my research. And um, I also wanted to just say, I think this relates to what maybe Dennis was saying, that uh, when I first was an art major, I was, I sort of resigned myself to be a painter because that was what I was familiar with and my instructor would always come and take my paintbrush away and I was always being pushed to make, like make it bigger, make it brasher, make it more expressive. And then when I was further along in my um, college experience, I finally took a printmaking class and it was so different and I was not, in that I, I was encouraged to keep doing what I was doing and it was so refreshing and so. Then I was a printmaker forever. <laughs> and Sang Mi Yu from Texas. Originally from South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> I just sat here to face Susan. <laughs> um, I uh, first got to know Susan uh, several years ago when. Uh, uh, Victoria Star Bonner curated an exhibition, uh, Midway, Midwest Matrix, Texas version, um, following the print legacy programs, um, uh, Texas version. So I was uh, honored to be part of that exhibition and got to know her project for the first time and remember introducing her video project as well to my students. Uh, now I'm in uh, Lubbock, Texas, West Texas, uh, teaching at Texas Tech University. And I've been there for about 14 years. Never thought I was gonna situate myself in te Texas, by the way. <laughs> uh, so I, I studied in, uh, in the Midwest, so I'm kind of, I have certain affinity with the Midwest uh, printmaking culture. All, the, all of my um, instructors were in the Midwest. Although, uh, when I first introduced to printmaking, uh, it was in South Korea at Seoul National University. Uh, several professors of my painting professors, they studied at Tyler School of Art 
and one of them went to Cranbrook, and I think he influenced, influenced my work mostly because he was a recent graduate from there, and it was very refreshing to me. And to me, um, similar to some of these artists who mentioned about why they became a printmaker, um, I was a painting major in my undergrad, and I was required to take printmaking. Then when I graduated, uh, I was working in a post-production doing some computer animation and so forth. And uh, I, on the side, I was uh, able to show in some group show exhibitions. And every time I confront painting canvas, it was such a struggle uh, facing the wall, blank wall. So it was a struggle as opposed to uh, working in the print shop where you're surrounded by a group of artists that are like-minded. It, it was such a relieving moment and I got more productive with the horizontal setting instead of vertical setting. So there was that uh, physical and communal aspect of printmaking that really drove me into printmaking. So ever since then, I stayed within the practice while I expanded uh, my notion of printmaking further, including installations. That's where um, my work is now. Uh, I use some expanded notions. So unlike some of these elaborate uh, printmakers over here, I feel a little bit humbled because I feel like I'm cheating <laughs> using digital methods. Although uh, I'm pretty... Um, efficient in traditional techniques while I'm teaching, but uh, at the moment, during, uh, because of the scale and the methods that I'm using, I'm kind of leaning more towards digital technology and uh, post printmaking techniques such as CNC, uh, laser cutting, and uh, uh, other hand methods. In fact, some of the, a lot of these digital prints, they are hand cut. So um, my smaller pieces are more laser cutting. So uh, the basis of my work, going back to 2004 in Lubbock, when I first moved to Lubbock, I had to find a kind of temporary rental place to stay in. And uh, I was a little appalled um, by the lack of selection of the houses. There was a, uh, it was a very strange experience at first. I've never been in the town that had such a such tract homes that are really uh, concentrated in uh, the small sections of the town with the limited choices of designs. At first, I was really, um, it was a very dreadful experience. <laughs> <laughs> My colleague, printmaker Stace and I used to drive around town videotaping all those uh, tract homes and uh, I'm so glad I didn't get caught by any neighbors. <laughs> then, <laughs> as time went on, Taking a look at my video documentation of all the houses, I found certain um, odd comfort, and also living in one of those houses was a, such a was such a relieving moment, as if I'm an animal in a camouflage, so I can easily blend into the neighborhood. So that was from my consciousness as well. Also, it goes back to my childhood memory of my grandmother who used to live in a Korean style tract homes in the 1970s. Uh, so that kind of memory brought back, got brought back and that was the reason why I got tied into. Then um, I was drawing um, some photographs from the towns that I visit such as Houston, Dallas, not to mention my hometown. Whenever I travel, I take photographs of the kind of archetypal houses that are more typical, tract homes, then document them. And more and more I do, um, I'm, I was kind of going away from the idea notion of home, and it be became an impossible idea. So that kind of an idea notion of home and my kind of original um, reactions to the houses, tract homes I saw in America. So that was a combination of my early pieces of these house and house cuts and digital prints and other traditional prints based on the house forms. So um, layering those house forms um, in paper cuts and uh, backdrop color patterns, that kind of resonates the uh, tactility um, as a tangible reality as opposed to um, illusion. So that may not be possible. So those two notions are always coinciding in my work 
And uh, currently, I'm moving into more of the botanical themes uh, found in botanic gardens in America. So started from Fort Worth Botanic Garden, and I'm planning to visit um, DC's Botanic Garden tomorrow so I can document some of the photos to be used for my um, future work. So I try to encase those exotic species found in conservatories of botanic gardens to reflect on uh, American notion of what the exoticism is, what the Asianness is, and so forth. So I can reflect on my current locations as opposed to how those things are viewed in uh, colonial and post-colonial notions. So that's pretty much where I am. Thank you. <laughs> So um, I guess we can open the floor for some questions if anybody would like to ask. And um, <clears throat> is that correct, Jack? Or? Yes, or they can ask each other. Oh, yes. OK, well, well I guess the, before we go into the audience, I, the goal of the exhibit in my mind was to present a spectrum of traditional uh, techniques and contemporary techniques and um, that the innovations that printmaking is pushing boundaries, I think it's one of the most exciting <clears throat> art forms, obviously. Um, and so maybe each of you could address, um, is that what you'd like? Something to the effect of Tom. <laughs> um, the expanding print, I mean, everybody's uh, view of, of printmaking in the big bad way that you do. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'm always, uh, in my stuff, I'm always pulling from art history, print history specifically, as much as I can. Um, when I first got into printmaking, um, I, I, when somebody, back in the day now, hands you a CD. Now it's, they can't hand you an MP3 or an iTunes, whatever. And I like that band. If I love it, I obsess over it. So I have to know everything about that band. I have to have everything by that band. And I was the same way when I figured out that I wanted to be a printmaker. So I obsessed over the history of it. Um, ran to the library after I pulled my first print, and I knew what du who Dürer was before that. And w to me, it was like finding members of my, my family. I feel like I'm related to those people. I feel like I know Dürer and Daumier and Posada and Goya and Hogarth, and they're like members of my family, so every day I go into the studio, I have to make prints that are as good as my heroes. Otherwise, what's the point? And um, I know what I'm capable of, of doing, and so that's sort of my daily thing, is to go in and try to make prints that were as good as Dürer made, or Daumier, or Posada. Dürer didn't have plywood. I have plywood. So Dürer's prints were really large for their day. Up until that point of the 14 and 1500s, they were two inch by two inch images on block that were made to, to go along with movable type. And they would take a virgin and child image and just repeat it over and over. And then Dürer came along and his prints were like 10 inches by 12 inches and they were massive. And, and so I'm kind of referencing Dürer and the fact that I'm going to make these, you know, huge, very technical woodcuts. The print that's in this, in this show are, it took four and a half years to do. And that's every day for carving six, seven hours a day. So it's, it's about going in for me and paying homage to history and bringing that stuff into the contemporary world. Uh, it's also my way of slowing things down. The world's moving so fast all the time and my life is so chaotic and out of control. Being able to sit there at a, at a block and carve an area of, that's three inches by three inches for 10 hours in a day, it sounds awful in a way, but it's actually quite calming. It's the only place that I'm in complete control of anything that I'm doing <laughs> in, my, in my life. So 
my whole thing is the reference of history and to bring it into to today. The, the image that I reference specifically in the print that's in the show here is uh, by Hans Berkmeyer, and it was uh, Two Lovers Surprised by Death. You should look it up. It's something else. But it's like five inches by eight inches, okay? So I'm taking the, the you know, the chiaroscuro woodcut look of that and blowing it up and making it contemporary. Okay, so Richard, may I ask, um, <clears throat> can you talk about your, your approach to traditional technique into your contemporary technique because you're doing so much digital drawing and <clears throat> how your love of drawing is so important, you know, in terms of your, you draw every day, all day. <clears throat> yeah. But he's a phenomenal, all phenomenal orthography. Um. Lithography to me is uh, the most wonderful medium because. Oh. oh. Thanks. Um, <laughs> the reason why I love litho so much is it's just pure drawing. And since I was a little kid, just hold it I've liked drawing. And so um, at the Kansas City Art Institute, uh, I was in the foundations program, started right out of high school, and I stumbled into. Uh, a print shop and asked somebody what that smell was. And they said, well, that's lithotine. And then I said, well, I'm taking this class next semester. And since then, I've loved litho. And Cynthia Osborne, when she retired, gave me five gallons of lithotine that was made in 1967. <laughs> and I still have that and I, oh God. <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> um, I don't use it all the time because I'm afraid to use it all up. <laughs> and so uh, drawing, I was drawn to stone simply because of the character of the stone. And then um, the iPad thing happened, uh, that commercial that Apple put out. And I always said, when the department chair at uh, Venture College said, you're gonna teach graphic design next semester. And I said, but I've been on a computer for only a month. And he says, well, do you have an MFA? And I said, yes. And he says, well, then you can do it. So, so the minute I got onto the computer and made a mark with a mouse, because they didn't have pins back then, I got so excited that I could draw on a computer that I just kept doing it. But then the, I, and I always said, if they ever had a flat surface with a pen, and I could draw on it digitally, I would buy one. So the minute I saw that commercial, I bought it. And it was expensive, $1,007, and then the, the pen was $100, and it's like, charge it on your charge card. So the minute I got it, I started drawing, and I haven't stopped. And I'm dead serious when I tell you, when I wake up in the morning, I'll make coffee, I sit down, and I draw, and then two, three, four in the morning, I go to bed, I just can't stop. It's, it's addictive, and um, the thing I like about it most is this. You know, you have a phone and you can do this, and you get closer and closer, and then all of a sudden you realize, shit, all I'm doing is drawing scribbles. <laughs> and then when I realized all art was scribbles, it opened up a whole new world to me. And I just wish when I was in art school, I could have done this to my lithographs, because then I would have known you know, what kind of marks I was making. And so for me, uh, loving drawing so much, the iPad has become, I think, my uh, favorite tool. And then taking it from uh, the iPad to the stone, um, for me, is really exciting. So Michael, <clears throat> why don't you talk a bit about your foray into, <clears throat> I met Michael at a, at a Southern Graphics Conference when you were a student and saw these beautiful silk screens about these cool cats, the border cats. And can you talk about the, the cat persona sure. a little bit? Um, mm, yeah, little so printmaking for me came at a time in my upbringing where I was at a crossroads in terms of my identity. And as an undergraduate student at Texas State University, I, with a graphic design background, I turned to printmaking to turn my graphic designs into like 
uh, a more authentic kind of artwork that wasn't limited to the screen resolution, one that was given agency to be exhibited um, on the white wall and 60 inch you know, eye level height. And um, it was different. So uh, I wanted my graphic designs to get that kind of attention through printmaking. And so that was the easiest transition. And um, what I was accustomed to was to design my compositions using Adobe Creative Cloud uh, and then translating those designs into prints. So for me, the, what made sense was to turn my screen prints into separations, separate them by color, layer them up to reproduce the design from the screen to paper. And it wasn't enough for me to make a formally successful transition from graphic design to screen print. Uh, I also had to have the history of screen print embedded within the imagery. So at that time, SB 1070 in Arizona was getting a lot of attention. And so I was starting to become aware of my identity as a minority in the States um, through Tangential Associations um, in San Marcos, which is like a small Texas college town. I was born and raised in San Antonio, which is like a big um, urban city, uh, like the seventh largest, I believe, in the States. Um, and so San Marcos was a different kind of experience, so I felt like I was being uh, sort of racialized in like microaggressions throughout my time at that university, but um, that sort of like f made me uh, want to explore my identity and, and question why I'd never thought about my identity before as a minority in the States up until that point in my education. So uh, I came to terms with, with the narrative of presenting my, uh, I guess, Latinidad as a cat. So um, I was raised in a mobile home park. Um, and people's relationships in mobile home parks, the cats, is sort of curious because not everyone welcomes cats uh, in that environment, and some people do. And so uh, my argument to my mom was, because we were like lower income, middle class family, I, I was cautioning my mom to not feed the cats because they would continue to reproduce and uh, they, we couldn't afford uh, the offspring and it was just like, a never-ending story, and um, that sort of sounded like mirroring the political debate around immigration, and so I sort of went with that um, gut instinct and created a, a mythology around migrant cats uh, n continuing to like flourish and sort of like take advantage of people who catered to them and fed them and sort of were like uh, feeding off of uh, nice people, and so. Uh, I just went with that, and then, um, long story short, rapid prototyping tools became a way to talk about my identity in printmaking. Um, and so um, I've done a few woodcuts that were done with the, the, the guide of a, a laser cutter or with a CNC router. So I feel like my interaction with printmaking or like traditional printmaking tools is to use a computer to try to uh, make an image. And so I, I feel like I'm at an intersection between like my identity and then printmaking as, printmaking's identity with trying to, what's print passing and then what's like uh, considered a successful print. Um, so I'm trying to find uh, the Latinx identity or approach to a traditional fine art print. And so I feel like my mission as an artist as a printmaker is to uh, place my Latinx identity with, within the printmaking world and use a computer to facilitate that because Mexican Americans or Mexicans have already made woodcut prints traditionally for centuries now. I feel like that narrative is not my narrative. My narrative is to infuse computer or rapid prototyping tools to create Mexican American identity prints and so I feel like that's where I'm at, and that's what I'm trying to set out to do. Uh, in terms of what's on display, I've sort of used video installation to move forward my printmaking practice, but with motion video. So um, yeah, that's a little bit of background on my work. So Steve, Steve, your work is, I've always loved your work, <clears throat> and um, I kind of described you in the catalog as sort of the new 
Catlett um, tradition in that her power of her work. Um, but can you talk about, I know you've been involved in printmaking beyond other types of work that you do, and I know you recently did some lithographs out at Notre Dame, and you also do very large scale community projects. And so what is your, your goal with your print work to push beyond boundaries of the history and your own history? Absolutely, Absolutely. Um, thank you, Susan. Um, I would say that, um, I guess one thing that's kind of foundational to my work um, is drawing. Um, and I remember from my earliest days that uh, putting mark to paper was very um, integral to my work. But as I continued to grow, um, not only as a person, but as an artist, uh, what became very important to me was approaching all the various media um, as a linguist would approach languages. And so um, I do printmaking, I do drawing, I do painting, I do sculpture, and I find, I'm trying to find interesting ways in which I can marry those different processes together um, and begin to speak through those various media. You know, what can be said with, you know, the color red, or what can be said with a charcoal drawing versus a pencil drawing? What can be said with a litho versus a screen print? And how do we, how do we feel when we see those different things? And so I'm, I'm interested in all those ways in which we can communicate. Um, I grew up in a household that was um, very creative. Um, I talk about my mom a lot because she was a person that was very creative in the kitchen um, in terms of what she was able to do as far as preparing for us as a family and providing. And, um, and I liken that, that idea of what she was able to provide and the creative ways in which she thought about food and how do you stretch it. Um, I liken that to the way in which I think about medium and how I make it, how I make things. But not only, I not only do I liken that to the medium and how I make things, I liken that same ideas in terms of how we interact with each other um, beyond looking at each other through the surface lens. Um, there's so much more to us as individuals in terms of our history and our stories and our journey. Um, and there's more connecting points than there are ones that would separate us. And so that becomes very important for me. Um, and then, as far as the community-based work, um, I see no separation from that because we, we grew up in a communal context um, in terms of what we influence by. And I happen to be a person that I've, I've lived in several different places. You know, I grew up in New Orleans and influenced by that rich roux and that rich gumbo of culture. You know, but then I went to grad school in Michigan. You know, and then it was a flip side of where I grew up with. And then I lived in Maryland. You know, then I lived in Virginia. Then I lived in Pennsylvania. Then I lived in Detroit. Now I'm back in Virginia again. You know, and so as he's moving around, each space is a different flavor. There's a different way in which there's a different cultural rhythms. There's different customs and all that stuff. So as an artist, engaging community, taking the different mediums and different tools and so forth, um, I, I do that. Um, and I use this idea to call the black line. And what I mean by that is, is that, um, uh, let, me, let me change that. Let me change that statement. If I just took three random people from the audience and had them make a piece of art, and if they didn't have any art experience, um, those people who with a lot of art experience may look at it and say, eh, "Look, it's a little elementary." But if you take two thousand people and have them make marks, and and if a person is crafty enough, can pull those voices together visually, then that which didn't look too good individually looks really beautiful and compelling when it's a whole bunch. I think about that same idea in terms of music. And if I told three people out of the audience that could not sing and they just sang something, they would be exposed. Whereas we take 2,000 people and tell them to sing something, just the sheer power of the voice and the sound will move us. It'll make your skin just crawl. And um, so I use those same kinds of notions, those ideas in terms of going out in the community and trying to enact a lot of people to work on a singular idea to get their individualized voices and how those individualized voices connect to other voices. But the most important part of that entire process, what I do in terms of community, is not the end product, it's the process. It's that which we go through together, is those conversations that take place through the, the convex of the artwork. You know, how do we make that happen? So um, another thing that's happening in my work too, I, the last thing I will leave with is that, um, it's starting to broaden and grab on other things. 
um, some elements of technology, but is tapping into, is grabbing onto movement in terms of dance, and it's grabbing, it's been grabbing on sound for a long time, you know, and so I'm just trying to grab different elements and how does that continue to enrich not only the visual texture, but the sound texture, um, uh, the spiritual texture. You know, how can I begin to speak to all those different multiple intelligencies in which we all operate on, you know, so. Oh, 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 okay, all right, I was, okay, so we, what are we supposed to do now? Well, we're getting right down to it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, okay, we were, okay, well, um, I'm sorry we didn't get the other group, are we to close? Yes, we continue the conversation. Oh, okay, all right, okay, I'm sorry. So we are going to continue the conversation in the other, in the, in the gallery, and each artist will be stationed near their extraordinary works of art, <clears throat> and um, thank you so much for your conversation and thank you Jack. <laughs>